are you? Oh, you catch me today in the shed of dreams. Here I am. Here I come for a little downtime. I've got my cardi on. I'm doing a little painting. Do you like it? It's lovely, isn't it? And I've got a brew. Oh, we all need a bit of downtime, don't we? Now, in your downtime, you've been sending me some questions. So, I'm going to attempt to answer some of them now, while we're having a brew. Okay, so settle yourself down. Now, the first one is about brownies. Everybody loves a brownie, don't they? What's your best recipe for brownies, Betty? Well, I have to say, I follow that lovely Nigella on the old uh, internet thing there. And what I like to do is uh, try out everybody's recipes. So I've tried all of the brownie recipes I can get my hands on. And I think personally, if you're an egg and butter fan, then you can't go further wrong than Nigella. Now, one of the best things to do is to think about when you're making brownies, don't overcook. Because a lot of people, they wait until they're properly firm before they get them out and then they're very disappointed. So don't. Just wait till they're a little like a little bit jelly-like in the middle and possibly with a crack on the top and then you're away and you'll have a lovely moist brownie. If you want a brownie that's suitable for everybody, no matter their dietary requirements, then there's some good vegan brownie recipes out there and you can always substitute that flour for some gluten-free. Now, I'll give you a little Betty video how to cook along in Betty's kitchen and garden. So we could do that, couldn't we? We could have a little vegan brownie recipe. Let's have that. Right, so that's the first one. The second one is from somebody called Georgia who wants to know, she says she's grown a lot of chilies this year. What should she do? Preserve them? Whatever. Well, there's plenty of recipes out there, Georgia, for chilli jam. It's a bit of a faff because you have to add lots of other ingredients. So like, you know, red tomatoes and, and some peppers and you whiz it all up. And it's very simple to make and I'll be doing a little chutney how-to cook along a little bit later in the series. But at the moment, I would say have a look at that. But do you know what? There's something super simple you can do if you've got too many chilies. And this is the same if you've bought them from the supermarket and you don't, you've used one and you've gone, that's enough. And you've still got three more that were in the packet. I freeze them. That's it. Pop them in the freezer just as they are. And then when you get them out to use them, you can just grate them straight from frozen or chop them up, whiz them in the, pro the processor, the food processor, you know, with your, you know, your garlic and your onion and your ginger and whatnot for your base, for your nice curry or your nice, you know, that sort of thing, something spicy. So that's what I would suggest. Be friends with your freezer. That's it. Now then, I think we've had some more questions. Hang on. Some of them were about growing things. So now let's have a little think about growing things. Now, we did have a question. I think it was from Chris, who was asking us about his sago palm. Now, that's a beautiful indoor palm. It's quite a tricky thing to grow. and You do have to be careful with indoor plants, I find. There's a whole thing, isn't there, about too much water, not enough water. Now, in our house, Bernard's in charge of the watering of the indoor plants and I leave it like that because otherwise it can get very confusing. Have they had a little, too little, not enough, too much and that's just as bad. A house plant doesn't like to be sitting around in, with soggy roots, that's the thing. So Chris has got a problem and he says his sago palm leaves are like going a bit brown. Well Chris I would say check your water in regime lovey. Have you got that right? The second thing to look at, have they got enough magnesium? Now, magnesium is one of those very important things that plants need to take in in order to make that whole getting green thing work, you know. So, they one way to do this, one way to do this is people do swear by Epsom salts. You can get them from the chemist. I believe Home Bargains does a good line in Epsom salts for not very much money. You could give them a little bath, so stand them in a little bowl of, little bowl of water with some Epsom salts dissolved in. So let them soak it up and then see if that gives you better results so your leaves stop going like yellow. And is it yellow veining on the leaves or have they just all gone yellow? And don't worry Chris Lovey, they'll come back. It might be though, if you have completely overwatered them, which we sometimes do, you know, kill by kindness. 
then you know you might need to dry it all out and, and then start again maybe but uh, give it a go anyway see if it's the watering regime and if not try the Epsom salt that's quite good I'm just going to refer to me other going, are you all right there yeah sitting comfortably that's very good now we have had a couple of requests of things that you'd like me to demonstrate so a bread and butter pudding I could do one of them with custard it's very straightforward really um, you'd butter your bread and uh, layer it up in a in a in a tin in a nice uh, oven baking thing maybe a ceramic one lovely I butter that first of course uh, layer it up with raisins and then whatever flavorings you like so a little sugar uh, maybe a little bit of cinnamon again or a little mixed spice that's always nice in there nutmeg then you make a nice custard a loose-ish custard don't, don't go too mad on that don't get one of those packet ones I'm not quite, I'm not keen on them terribly much and um, not for them no and um, and then we'll uh, and then pour that over and then bake that off in the oven and that's lovely I mean there is another version that my grandmother used to do and other people's will remember as well where you soaked your bread for ages and then you had a whole thing with suet and oh la oh that stuck to your ribs that was hearty stuff you know it came out like solid oh yeah you could build walls with that anyway there's that and then, um, oh, our friend Wenny, uh, she wanted to know, oh, what's going wrong with the Yorkshires? Oh, Yorkshires, eh? Aren't they a thing? Well, uh, just let me have a sip of tea. Mm. Yorkshire puddings. Do you know, for years I struggled with the Yorkshire. I really did. I struggled with the Yorkshires. But now I think I've got it nailed. My recipe is that you get, for every egg you're going to use, 35 grams of just plain flour now some people make the mistake of using self-raising and I think that's where I was going wrong so 35 grams of plain flour and 50 grams of milk and don't bother watering it down or anything like that give it a really good beating you know so give it a whisking it up keep that on one side and get your tray that you're going to use and I do like little individuals I know it's not traditional and I know traditional Yorkshires are made in a single tray don't write in and tell me so little individuals or you can get now the between the two so not all the tiny little ones you can get a sort of ones about that size that's right so I do that would do that mix with one egg would do two of them so if it's just a couple of people who are Yorkshire fans or you're just testing it just get one of them and just do two put some oil in so I just use a plate of good sunflower oil something like that nothing fancy get it in the oven and get it really hot now that's the important bit you've got to have hot oil or nothing's going to puff up at all in your life so get your oven to like oh 200 200 plus get your oil really hot get it out pour your mixture in equally to those two things pop them back in and it's 20 minutes don't open the oven just let it go see what happens after that see how you get on Wenny send us a picture of your Yorkshire's I hope that works for you ducky right now then was there another question oh hang on I'm just going to have a look at my list here. Oh, are you doing all right? Have you got a cup? Have you got a brew? Yeah, that's it. We're all right. Yeah. What can we grow in the winter? Now, it's it's always good, isn't it, to go out in the garden in the winter, in the yard or whatever you've got, and see something green and think, oh, I can eat that. That's lovely. So here's some things you can grow in the winter. Kale. I know that doesn't sound appealing, but these modern kale varieties are not as bitter as they used to be. So kale, and it's very good for you. Cabbage, that's also good, but you have to have really good soil so you can really boost up your cabbages and get a nice head going. With kale, they're quite tolerant and they'll just, you could just strip off some leaves at a time and then keep coming back and having, you know, a few more. So that's quite good. Chard is the same. Rainbow chard, very pretty. All different coloured stems come out. Chop the whole thing up. I mean, don't take the whole thing at once. Take a few leaves at a time for each meal. Chop it all up. Give it a steam or maybe stir, pop it in a stir, right, it's delicious, it's lovely, it's like spinach, that sort of thing. All right, so maybe what we could do is we'll sort out some plants so we can share some round. All right, so you can get those, go those going as well. Yeah, very good. All right, lovelies. Um, now, what was the other thing? Oh, yes, Kath wanted to know about deadheading. Well, what I'm going to do is ask my friend Tim to show you how he does his deadheading on his dahlias. All right, then. So we'll do that 
and we'll show you how to make brownies that are suitable for everybody all right then louise okay so it's over and out from betty's kitchen and garden in the shed of dreams okay just having a nice little brew okay then you settle down now all right lovelies yeah nice to Oh, oh, I can't get to you. Nice to see you. All right. Bye then. Bye. Bye. Oh, hello, lovelies. Right, today we're in Tim's Garden. It's got its own hashtag on Instagram, so if you want to follow it, it's full of lovely flowers. Look at these beautiful dahlias. Now, I'm just going to ask Tim about deadheading. Here he is. Here's Tim. Hello, Tim. Hello there. Right, Tim, what are we doing here today, then? Well, in order to keep the dahlias flowering, we have to take the dead heads off. Right. Like I'm doing at the moment. Oh, very good. Yes. Yeah. So what do you think? What are you using to do that then there, Tim? A pair what's... of uh, secateurs. Yes. Yeah. What's it? What's good about them? What's uh, what's important about your secateurs then? Well, they've got to be sharp. Yes. Uh, and they've, they've got to be easy to work. Yes, they have. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So show us in slow motion then what you, your action around deadheading. So, okay. So well, is that... There's What's a dead on? head. Oh, there. hang on, let me get a nice shot of that close up. Oh, did... oh that looks poorly, doesn't it? Has it flowered already? Has yes, it gone that, over? That's gone over now. All right, so what so are you doing? Oh, hang secateurs. on, let me just get a good picture. Oh, yeah, it's got the secateurs right. there. Yes, yes. And off it comes. Oh, right so you, ju you just take off the, that little bit of head there. That's that, right. Oh, lovely. That's right. And that's how you keep your dahlias looking so smashing. That's right. Oh, brilliant. That's super, Tim. Thanks ever so much for your help. All right, ta now. Ta-ra, Bye-bye.